Miss Plar by Thomas Legati It was spring, though still quite early in the season, when a young woman came to live with us. Her purpose was to manage the affairs of the household while my mother was suffering some vague ailment, lingering but not serious, and my father was away on business. She arrived on one of those misty, drizzling days which often prevailed during the young months of that particular year, and which remain in my memory as the signature of this remarkable time. Since my mother was self-confined to her bed and my father absent, it was left for me to answer those sharp, urgent rappings at the front door. How they echoed throughout the many rooms of the house reverberating in the farthest corners of the upper floors. Pulling on the curved metal door handle, so huge in my child's hand, I found her standing with her back to me and staring deep into a world of darkening mist. Her black hair glistened in the light from the vestibule. As she turned slowly around, my eyes were fixed upon that great ebony turban of hair folded so elaborately into itself again and again, yet in some way rebelling against this discipline, with many shiny strands escaping their bonds and bursting out wildly. Indeed, it was through a straggle of miscovered locks that she first glared down at me, saying, My name is... I know, I said, but at that moment it was not so much her name that I knew, despite my father's diligent recitations of it to me, as all the unexpected correspondences I sensed in her physical presence. For even after she stepped into the house, she kept her head slightly turned and glanced over her shoulder through the open door, watching the elements outside and listening with intense expectancy. By then this stranger had already gained a precise orientation amid the world's chaos of faces and other phenomena. Quite literally, her place was an obscure one, lying somewhere deep within the peculiar mood of that spring afternoon when the natural gestures of the season had been apparently distanced and suppressed by an otherworldly desolation a seething luxuriance hidden behind dark battlements of clouds looming above a bare, practically hibernal landscape. And the sounds for which she listened also seemed remote and stifled, shut out by a mute and sullen twilight, smothered in that tower of stone-gray sky. However, while Miss Plor appeared to reflect with exactitude all the signs and mannerisms of those days all shackled in gloom, her place in our household was still in uncertainty. During the early part of her stay with us, Miss Plor was more often heard than seen. Her duties, whether by instruction or her own interpretation, had soon engaged her in a routine of wandering throughout the echoing rooms and hallways of the house. Rarely was there an interruption in those footsteps as they sounded upon aged floorboards. Day and night this gentle crepitating signaled the whereabouts of our vigilant housekeeper. In the morning I awoke to the movements of Miss Plor on the floors above or below my bedroom, while late in the afternoon, when I often spent time in the library upon my return from school, I could hear the clip-clopping of her heels on the parquet in the adjacent room. Even late at night, when the structure of the house expressed itself with a fugue of noises, Miss Plor augmented this decrepit music with her own slow pacing upon the stairs or outside my door. One time I felt myself awakened in the middle of the night, though it was not any disturbing sounds that had broken my sleep, and I was unsure exactly what made it impossible for me to close my eyes again. Finally, I slid out of bed, quietly opened the door of my room a few inches, and peeped down the darkened hallway. At the end of that long passage was a window filled with the livid radiance of moonlight, and within the frame of that window was Miss Plar, her entire form shaded into a silhouette as black as the blackness of her hair, which was all piled up into the wild shape of some night blossom. 
So intently was she staring out the window that she did not seem to detect my observance of her. I, on the other hand, could no longer ignore the force of her presence. The following day I began a series of sketches. These works first took form as doodles in the margins of my school books, but swiftly evolved into projects of greater size and ambition. Given the enigmas of any variety of creation, I was not entirely surprised that the images I had elaborated did not include the overt portrayal of Miss Plar herself, nor of other persons who might serve by way of symbolism or association. Instead, my drawings appeared to illustrate scenes from a tale of some strange and cruel kingdom. Possessed by curious moods and visions, I depicted a bleak domain that was obscured by a kind of fog or cloud whose depths brought forth a plethora of incredible structures, all of them somehow twisted into aspects of bizarre savagery. From the matrix of this fertile haze was born a litter of towering edifices that combined the traits of castle and crypt, many-peaked palace and multi-chambered mausoleum. But there were also clusters of smaller buildings, warped offshoots of the greater ones, housing perhaps no more than a single room, an apartment of ominously skewed design, an intimate dungeon cell reserved for the most exclusive captivity. Of course, I betrayed no special genius in my execution of these phantasmal venues. My technique was as barbarous as my subject and certainly I was unable to introduce into the menacing images any suggestion of certain sounds that seemed integral to their proper representation, a kind of oral accompaniment to these operatic stage sets. In fact, I was not able even to imagine these sounds with any degree of clarity, yet I knew that they belonged in the pictures, and that, like the purely visible dimension of these works, their source could be found in the person of Miss Plar. Although I had not intended to show her the sketches, there was evidence that she had indulged in private viewings of them. They lay more or less in the open on the desk in my bedroom. I made no effort to conceal my work, and I began to suspect that their order was being disturbed in my absence to sense a subtle disarrangement that was vaguely telling but not conclusive. Finally, upon returning from school one gray afternoon, I discovered a sure sign of Miss Plar's investigations, for lying between two of my drawings, pressed like a memento in an old scrapbook, was a long black strand of hair. I wanted to confront Miss Plar immediately regarding her intrusion not because I resented it in any way, but solely to seize the occasion to approach this devious eccentric and perhaps draw closer to the strange sights and sounds she had brought into our household. However, at that stage of her term of employment, she was no longer so easily located, having ceased her constant noisy marauding and begun practicing more sedentary or stealthy rituals. Since there was no sign of her elsewhere in the house, I went directly to the room which had been set aside for her, and which I had previously respected as her sanctum. But as I slowly stepped up to the open doorway, I saw that she was not there. After entering the room and rummaging about, I realized that she was not using it at all, and perhaps had never settled in. I turned around to continue my search for Miss Plor when I found her standing silently in the doorway and gazing into the room without fixing her eyes on anything or anyone within it. I nevertheless appeared to be in a position of chastisement, losing all the advantage I earlier possessed over this invader of my sanctum. Yet there was no mention of either of these transgressions despite what seemed our mutual understanding of them, we were helplessly drifting into an abyss of unspoken reproaches and suspicions. Finally, Miss Plor rescued us both by making an announcement she had obviously been saving for the right moment. I have spoken with your mother, 
she declared in a strong voice, and we have concluded that I should begin tutoring you in some of your weaker school subjects. I believe that I must have nodded or offered some other gesture of assent. Good, she said. We will start tomorrow. Then, rather quietly, she walked away, leaving her words to resound in the cavity of that unoccupied room. Unoccupied, I may claim, since my own presence now seemed to have been eclipsed by the swelling shadow of Miss Plar. Nonetheless, this extra-scholastic instruction did prove of immense value in illuminating what, at the time, was my weakest subject, Miss Plar in general, with special attention to where she had made accommodations for herself in our household. My tutelage was conducted in a room that Miss Plar felt was especially suited to the purpose, though her reasoning may not have been readily apparent. For the place she had selected to impart her lessons to me was a small attic located beneath a roof toward the back of the house. The slanted ceiling of that room exposed to us its rotting beams like the ribbing of some ancient sea-going vessel that might carry us to unknown destinations, and there were cold drafts that eddied around us, opposing currents emanating from the warped frame in which a many-paned window softly rattled now and then. The light by which I was schooled was provided by overcast afternoons fading in that window assisted by an old oil lamp which Miss Plar had hung upon a nail in one of the attic rafters. I still wonder where she unearthed that antique. It was this greasy lamplight that enabled me to glimpse a heap of old rags which had been piled in a corner to form a kind of crude bedding. Nearby stood the suitcase Miss Plar had arrived with. The only furniture in this room was a low table, which served as my desk, and a small frail chair, both articles being relics of my early childhood and no doubt rediscovered in the course of my teacher's many expeditions throughout the house. Seated at the center of the room, I submitted to the musty pathos of my surroundings. In a room such as this, Miss Plor asserted, one may learn certain things of the greatest importance. So I listened while Miss Plar clomped noisily about, wielding a long wooden pointer which had no blackboard to point to. All considered, however, she did deliver a series of quite fascinating lectures. Without attempting to render the exact rhetoric of her discourse, I remember that Miss Plar was especially concerned with my development in subjects that often touched upon history or geography, occasionally broaching realms of philosophy and science. She lectured from memory, never once hesitating in her delivery of countless facts that had not reached me by way of the conventional avenues of my education. Yet these talks were nonetheless as meandering as her footsteps upon the cold floor of that attic room, and at first I was breathless trying to follow her from one point to the next. Eventually, though, I began to extract certain themes from her chaotic syllabus. For instance, she returned time and again to the earliest twitchings of human life, portraying a world of only the most rudimentary law, but one intriguingly advanced in what she called visceral practices. She allowed that much of what she said in this way was speculative. In her discussions of later periods, she deferred to the restrictions while also enjoying the explicitness of accepted records. Hence, I was made intimate with those ancient atrocities which gained renown for a Persian monarch, with a century-old massacre in the Brazilian backlands, and with the specific methods of punishment employed by various societies often relegated to the margins of history, and in other flights of instruction, during which Miss Plar might flourish her pointer in the air like an artist's paintbrush. I was introduced to lands whose chief feature was a kind of brutality and an air of exile, coarse and torturous terrains, deliriums of earth and sky. 
These included desolate, fog-bound islands in polar seas, countries of barren peaks lacerated by unceasing winds, wastelands that consumed all sense of reality in their vast spaces, shadowed realms littered with dead cities, and sweltering hells of jungle where light itself is tinged with a bluish slime. At some point, however, Miss Plor's specialized curriculum, once so novel and engrossing, dulled with repetition. I started to fidget in my miniature seat, my head slumped over my miniature desk. Then her words suddenly stopped, and she drew close to me, laying her rubber-tipped pointer across my shoulder. When I looked up, I saw only those eyes glaring down at me, and that black bundle of hair outlined in the dismal light drifting through the attic like a glowing vapor. In a room such as this, she whispered, one may also learn the proper way to behave. The pointer was then pulled away, grazing my neck, and Miss Plor walked over to the window. Outside, one of the great mists of that spring obscured the landscape, as if seen through murky sheets of ice, everything appeared remote and hallucinatory. An indeterminate figure herself, Miss Plor gazed out at a world of shadows bound in place. She also seemed to be listening to it. Do you know the sound of something that stings the air? She asked, swinging her pointer lightly against herself. I understood her meaning and nodded my compliance, but at the same time I imagined more than a teacher's switch as it came down upon a pupil's body. Sounds more serious and more strange intruded upon the hush of the classroom. They were faraway sounds, lost in the hissing of rainy afternoons, immense blades sweeping over vast spaces expansive wings cutting through cold winds, long whips lashing in darkness. I also heard the sound of things that were stinging the air in places beyond all comprehension. These sounds grew increasingly louder. Finally, Miss Plor dropped her pointer and put her hands over her ears. That will be all for today, she shouted and neither did she hold class on the following day, nor ever again resume my tutelage. It seemed, however, that my lessons with Miss Plor had continued in a different form. Those afternoons in that attic must have exhausted something within me, and for a brief time I was unable to leave my bed. During this period I noticed that Miss Plor was suffering a decline of her own, allowing the intangible sympathies which had already existed between us to become so much deeper and more entangled. To some extent it might be said that my own process of degeneration was following hers, much as my faculty of hearing, sensitized by illness, followed her echoing footsteps as they moved about the house, for Miss Plar had reverted to a restless wandering somehow having failed to settle herself into any kind of repose. On her visits to my room, which had become frequent and were always unexpected, I could observe the phases of her dissolution on both a material and a psychic level. Her hair now hung loose about her shoulders, twisting itself in the most hideous ways like a dark mesh of nightmares a foul nest in which her own suspicions were swarming. Moreover, her links to a strictly mundane order had become shockingly decayed, and my relationship with her was conducted at the risk of intimacy with spheres of a highly questionable nature. One afternoon I awoke from a nap to discover that all the drawings she had inspired me to produce had been torn to pieces and lay scattered about my room but this primitive attempt at exorcism proved to have no effect, for in the late hours of that same night I found her sitting on my bed and leaning close to me, her hair brushing against my face. "'Tell me about those sounds,' she demanded. "'You've been doing this to frighten me, haven't you?' 
For a while I felt she had slipped away altogether, severing our extraordinary bond and allowing my health to improve. But just as I seemed to be approaching a full recovery, Miss Plar returned. I think that you are much better now, she said as she entered my room with a briskness that seemed to be an effort. You can get dressed today. I have to do some shopping, and I want you to come along and assist me. I might have protested that to go out on such a day would cause me to relapse, for outside waited a heavy spring dampness and so much fog that I could see nothing beyond my bedroom window. But Miss Plar was already lost to the world of wholesome practicalities, while her manner betrayed a hypnotic and fateful determination that I could not have resisted. As for this fog, she said, even though I had not mentioned it, I think that we shall be able to find our way. Having a child's weakness for prospects of misadventure, I followed Miss Plar into that fog-smothered landscape. After walking only a few steps, we lost sight of the house, and even the ground beneath our feet was submerged under layers of a pale, floating web. But she took my hand and marched on as if guided by some peculiar vision. And it was by her grasp that this vision was conducted into me, setting both of us upon a strange path. Yet as we progressed, I began to recognize certain shapes gradually emerging around us, that brood of dark forms which pushed through the fog as if their growth could no longer be contained by it. When I tightened my grip on Miss Plar's hand, which seemed to be losing its strength, fading in its substance, the vision surged toward clarity, with the aspect of some leviathan rising into view from the abyss, a monstrous world to find itself before our eyes, forcing its way through the surface of the fog, which now trailed in wisps about the structures of an immense and awful kingdom. More expansive and intricate than my earlier purely artistic imaginings, these structures sprung forth like a patternless conglomerate of crystals, angular and many-faceted monuments clustering in a misty graveyard. It was a dead city indeed, and all residents were entombed within its walls, or they were nowhere. There were streets of a sort which cut through this chaos of architecture, winding among the lopsided buildings, and yet it all retained an interlocking unity, much like a mountain range of wildly carved peaks and chasms, and very much like the mountainous and murky thunderheads of a rainy season. Surely the very essence of a storm inhered in the jagged dynamism of these structures, a pyrotechnics that remained suspended or hidden, its violence a matter of suspicion and conjecture, suggesting a realm of atrocious potential, that infinite country which hovers beyond fogs and mists and gray heaping skies. But even here, something remained obscured, a sense provoked of rites or observances being enacted in concealment. And this peculiar sense was aroused by certain sounds, as of smothered cacophonous echoes lashing out in black cells and scourging the lengths of blind passages. Through the silence of the fog, they gradually disseminated. Do you hear them? asked Miss Plar, though by then they had already risen to a conspicuous stridency. There are rooms we cannot see where those sounds are being made. Sounds of something that stings the air. Her eyes seemed to be possessed by the sight of these rooms she spoke of. Her hair was mingling with the mist around us. Finally, she released her hold on my hand and drifted onward. There was no struggle. She had known for some time what loomed in the background of her wandering and what waited her approach. Perhaps she thought this was something she could pass on to others, or in which she might gain their company. But her company, her proper company, had all the time been preparing for her arrival elsewhere. 
Nevertheless, she had honored me as the heir of her visions. The fog swept around her and thickened once again until there was nothing else that could be seen. After a few moments I managed to gain my geographical bearings, finding myself in the middle of the street only a few blocks from home. Soon after the disappearance of Miss Plor, our household was again established in its routine. My mother made a strong recovery from her pseudo-illness, and my father returned from his business excursion. The hired girl, it seemed, had vacated the house without giving notice, a turn of events that caused little surprise in my mother. Such a flighty creature, she said about our former housekeeper. I supported this characterization of Miss Plar, but offered nothing that might suggest the nature of her flight. In truth, no word of mine could possibly have brought the least clarity to the situation, nor did I wish to deepen the mysteries of this episode by revealing what Miss Plor had left behind in that attic room. For me this chamber was now invested with a dour mystique, and I revisited its drafty spaces on several occasions over the years, especially on afternoons in early spring when I could not close my ears to certain sounds that reached me from beyond a gray mist or from skies of hissing rain, as if somewhere the tenuous forms of spirits were thrashing in a dark and forsaken world. 